we explained um, through the scriptures um, how when a man lies with a woman that uh, blood is shed and that covenant is, broke, is made and at that time it is now recognized that they are one and we spent a lot of time on showing you the seals and the signs and the covenant, the seal and the sign that it will never rain again on earth is a, which, that's good, but what is it that we get in the sky? Okay, a seal and a sign that we are in Christ, we are, thank you, and a seal and a sign that we have become one, man and woman before God, a three-chord strand not easily broken is sex. It's precious, it's beautiful, and it's been twisted. And we want to bring some lies out today. I get to talk to the women today, and then David gets to talk to the men next week. Lucky. Um, okay, so the uh, lures and the lies that he uses um, is the first thing is, is that with Lori's story, being redeemed and clean, living in shame, there's people in here who have been raped, who have been, uh, who have raped. There's people in here who have had um, the, um, sex and perversion, which gives you great shame. Now, I hope that you can come to God's redeeming love and understand how fully you have been purged, made pure, redeemed, sanctified, set apart for good work now. I think that last story that you told was awesome about the key because the scripture tells us that God has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we bind on earth will be bound in uh, heaven and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So when you see these scriptures and we go through them tonight or uh, today, uh, you'll understand a little bit about what God's plan was for sex. He gives us these parameters or these safeguards or these guardrails to keep us in a place so that we don't go driving off the cliff. He's not a killjoy. He made sex. He gave you sex. He knows what it's for. He wants you to enjoy it. It is sacred to him, and he wants you to use it in the context that's going to keep you healthy and safe. And um, I want to have you read with me this morning this scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolater, nor the adulterer, nor the male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the junkards, nor the slanderers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Stop. He's talking to his brethren. He's talking to a people who have been redeemed. He says that there's probably in this room, one out of three women have either experienced incest or and men have been sexually somehow um, uh, violated. And he says, we were all in this category, either perpetrating or having, the, ha having been offended by a perpetrator. And he says, all of us were in some measure of this place. And I know that's hard to hear, but the truth is, that's the truth. And what he's saying is, is that once you become in Christ, you've been washed. That's why I served our communion. I'm like, you're washed. You're brand new. You, you've been sanctified, purified. I talk to many girls who have had sex prior to marriage, and there is a sense of guilt. We, we started this um, series talking about guilt and shame. Guilt is about what you've done. Shame is about who you are. And those two coupled together is a Molotov cocktail from hell to make, meant to drive you into the ground through depression. And so when you see, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were just as if you never sinned in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Then he goes on more profoundly to talk. I just want to take a caveat one minute with you guys. Last week I shared with you my, what I believe is a catheology. Um, I think I could substantiate it through God's grace, Old and New Testament, but this is what I believe. When it's talking about the kingdom of God, it's talking about the uh, loca it's talking about an operating system. When it's talking about the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about a location. So you find that through the Gospels to understand that a little better, but what I understand when I read the scripture in the light of God's love and his redeeming power and grace in my life, when I look at that scripture, I see that God says every one of these modalities, every one of these sins and offenses are stemmed in rebellion. I'm going to do it my way, God. I'm not going to do it your way. I don't care what you said. I'm my own God. I'm going to do it the way that I see fit to do it, even though I know better. And what that is at the core, at the base root, is rebellion. 
And so you have to understand that God can't allow rebellion into heaven. He doesn't want to make this mess happen all over again. He wants you in this dispensation to realize his love and his grace and enjoy that so that you don't have to try to manipulate it and, and be covert in heaven when you get there. Having this experience here in this great perceived darkness and this great challenge in our flesh is us surrendering ourselves when it's hard so that when it's easy, it's a no-brainer. When we get to heaven, we don't have to fight through these things. And there is no rebellion in our heart. There's just this love that he wants to share from the beginning of time to now. So again, one more thing. Every one of those, we talked uh, about homosexuality. We talked about idolatry. We talked about lying, swindling. Every one of those sins are the same. We can't have categories of sin. Abortion can't be worse than homosexuality. Homosexuality can't be worse than somebody who's fornicating. They're all the same. You're in rebellion. You're like, I like it, I hear you, I'm going to do it my way. Everybody says that, everybody's doing it, it's okay. And God says, listen, i got a plan for you that's so rich and so good. He says, I purposed you into this earth. And when you stop trying to do it your way and start trusting me, you're going to live life to a degree that you don't even know that there's a possibility to have. A joy, a freedom, a peace, provision in everything that you do. So... If there's guilt and shame in any of these areas, I do, just like Lori said, I do recommend that you would have confidence with somebody who is fruitful and, and talk about things that you need to come up, uh, need to have your soul cleansed in. It says in James, it says that when we confess our sins to one another, we, be, we are healed. It's important not to carry that weight around with you. Um, you know, people have had so many infractions, DUIs, they've They've hit, they've robbed. There's, there's little things that, that just, the little foxes eating the vine saying, if they knew, if they knew, if they knew. And you disqualify yourself from being really in full sonship based on your past. And the truth is this, is this as far, as, uh, as far away as the east is from the west? It's as far as away as the east is from the west. Let's continue in this scripture in the same vein. He's still talking to Christians, and he says to them, he says, everything is permissible. Everything, you can, you can have horns coming out of your temples. I was in dentistry for a couple of years, about eight years, and this kid come in, nice looking kid. He, you know, he had his golf thing going on. It's cool, I'm not, everything's fine. But he wanted us to file his teeth down into fangs. And the doctor that I was working for at the time was going to do it. And I would not assist him. I would not be a part of that. I was really in this young man's face. I mean, you, you're like 22 right now. You don't even know what's going on. You're going to have fangs for the rest of your life. You don't want this. And he was just in this trip of being different. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not on this. I'm not, I, I rebelled, walked out. And, and you can have anything done. I, I don't care about tattoos. I don't care about you poking things in your body so you have protrusions. I don't care about holes and rips. It's okay with me. Everything is permissible, but it's not real smart. Okay. Okay. Everything is permissible, but not everything is going to benefit you. And this is why it's really good to have coaches, pastors, leaders, fathers, uncles, big brothers in your life and big sisters in your life to be able to share these times of transition. We all go through them. I'm going through a transition right now from one season to another one. I mean, there's a transition for everybody. So when you talk about it being beneficial, everything is beneficial for everything is everything is permissible for me but I will be mastered by none. So let's take a look here. And I, I had this discussion with the Lord because it's so sacred to me that the people in my, in my family that have homosexual life, uh, uh, um, um, life, what? Lifestyles, I was going to say life skills. <laughs> um, it didn't work. <laughs> um, um, that, that they're not offended by me because I started wrong. Because all I saw was they were going straight to hell doing this. This was like this sin somehow in my little legalistic mind at the time was much bigger than the other sins of which I was probably operating in at the time and didn't even under, understand that I was a manipulator. But so I will be mastered by none. One of the things that you'll see in these sexual sins like fornication and like adultery and like lust, these sex sins, which is what we're talking about, is, is that in these sins, it's so driven by lust. You can't get enough. It masters you. Listen, a pedophile touching a child. The child grows. 
You think he would have had everything he needed? No, he finds another child. You cannot get enough. This perversion will take you and take you and take you. Then we have these sex addicts now. Then we have all these things that are going on with people with pornography. You think, oh, I'll just look at a few naked ladies, that's fine. But what this is going to take you to, you can't get enough. It gets deeper and deeper. People will say, I'll go from, I just started looking at the pictures, then I started the phones, then I went out and started meeting people in the street, and before I knew it, I was divorced. I had $70,000 in debt because I gave myself because it mastered me, and trust me that that is what this sin will do. And this is why it's not us saying, don't. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. That's not what we're saying. We're saying run. Run as hard and fast as you can. Run somewhere where you can learn and get the skill sets that you need never to be mastered. Not only by that. Listen, so, okay, so your loins aren't mastering you. Is your belly mastering you? Is your money mastering you? Is your, your, your perception to other people mastering you? I will be mastered by nothing by, but Jesus Christ. And, and his love. And so when we look at these scriptures, it's by no means condemning. What did I do with my slipper? Um, it's no means condemning. It's really one of these very sacred instructions that he says, my son, attend to my words. Bind them to your heart. Listen to what your father's saying. If you'll do it, you'll see wealth of days and good, good life. I'll give you honor with me, and I'll give you honor with men. You will be more full than you've ever realized you could be. But this is what we do. This is how God looks down on us. I do it my way. That's what I'm going to do. I'll do it my way. I know that's what they say. And there's a whole book written on it. It's called the Book of Hosea. This book is stunning. This is about Israel running from God. And God uses this metaphor with Hosea. He says, go get your wife. Her name was Gomer. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a sad. Maybe I, oh, I can understand her plight now. I don't know. Anyway, but Hosea said, God said, go get her, even though she's adulterous, even though she won't love you, even though right now she's running around with unfaithful lovers. Go get her. Go get her. Go get her. This is a picture of God with us. And he says, he says in Isaiah, he says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as wool. Though they are red as crimson, I'm going to make them like snow. This is why when you see a bride being married, her dress is white. She brings her purity to her love, to her, her, her betrothed. I mean, there's so much sanctity in this and so much beauty. It says food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Um, I've spent a lot of time, and I'm sure you, you have, explaining to young girls the sanctity of, of, of sex and how perfect it is in, in God's design. And when the body, and when the scripture says that the two shall become one, if I see somebody who's had so many sexual multiple partners, I'll sit down and I'll talk to them. They, they'll, they'll get to a place where they can't trust. They, they don't trust. They can't be loved. They have a lot of duplicity in their mind. So they go from, loca from, from one divorce to the next divorce to the next divorce, not literally being married, but literally going from one relationship to the next relationship, and their heart is broken. Their heart is broken. Their heart is broken. And as a result, they, they're, they're, they're a broken human being looking for somebody to love them. I love what Andy Stanley says. Um, he says, you want to become the one that you want to marry. You want to become the one that you want to marry. So instead of looking for somebody to fix you and make it right, you want to be the very person that it is that you're looking to marry. And so when he talks about immorality um, for the Lord or to the Lord's body, take a look at this scripture. He says, run. Run from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. But uh, he, and then he goes on to say, but you, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. He goes on to say, last part of the scripture, by his power. So he's saying when you lay your body down with anybody else, when you walk into that bar, or when you watch that porno flick, or when you're, you're you know, pumping heroin into your arms, Jesus, 
like we said last week, everybody is pre-saved. The whole world has been saved. Not everybody's redeemed. Not everybody's redeemed. That's our job. We're ambassadors to tell them, you need to get into this ark, be safe, so that you can have the beautiful safety that comes with being in this kingdom system. He goes on to say that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is working in you to master not only these lusts, but it's also working in you so that um, any, any disrepair, any, any idea that you, you, somehow you've damaged yourself, it will be restored. So he goes on to say, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. He will also raise you also, giving you a new body. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ himself? Shall then we take the members of Christ and, and, you, and unite it with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with Christ is one with him. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will now dwell in you when you receive forgiveness. You just say, God, I, I get it. I get it. I see. I see my past. I see the shrapnel of sin everywhere. I see relationships. I see mothers with many children from many fathers. I see broken relationships and a lot of hurt and pain. I, I get it. I'm, I'm coming to you and I'm asking you to make me new. I invite you into my life and to start to lead me, renew me, refresh me, and give me the direction that I need. Um, this is why when uh, Paul's talking that you, you're, you're taking Christ with you, the, the picture of that was the reason why I quit smoking. It's because when I saw myself blowing smoke in Jesus' face, there was a whole different image for me. And I think the same thing will be what we talk about with women today. Now, I just want to say this very quickly because you got to go through those scriptures. They're a little weighty, and I wanted to get them all out so that we could give them justice. But here's what I'm saying to you. In Christ, everything is made new. Everything. When you come to him, even if you're struggling, Jesus is the best accountability partner on the planet. Tell him that you're struggling. Tell him that you, you don't understand why this is going on or why you're, why you're, you're, you're having these feelings. Get with people that you trust that have fruit in their life and start talking about it if you're struggling with situations. Um, if you've given yourself, there's already healing. You can be made new instantaneously. The moment you receive him, his redeeming power, the same power that restored Christ's body from its fractured, bloodied, torn apart self, he renewed every part of it, is now living in you. He can renew every fractured, torn apart inner being self that you have. He'll heal you inside as well as outside. I want you to take a look at this as I talk to women for just a minute. Um, one of the things that the serpent tells us and he lies to us is about um, having uh, sex be very manipulating. And this is something that is um, uh, very prevalent and it comes from a culture that we're really steeped in now. Um, when you look at things like hooters and tilted kilt, I had no idea what the tilted kilt was. I was like so green. I'm like, really? I think maybe we should go try some Scottish food. David's like, you don't want to try that food. <laughs> I, and I didn't, I didn't even believe it. Some of y'all don't know. A tilted kilt. A kilt? OK. Um, 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 the the uh, Twin Peaks, the, the uh, pregnant at 16, all these, all these ideas that you have that are before you, that are tempting you. And so girls think that that's what attracts men. And girls think that if I dress that way, that's going to make me socially acceptable. And the truth is, is that, like I said before, if you try to attract men with your body, you will receive or you will lure in body snatchers. That's what they'll want. But if you'll show them uh, a personable heart, a, a heart that is sincere, somebody who knows who they are and can stand on principles that make them... Uh, um, a, a solid human being. They know where they come from. They don't have to struggle with trying to seduce or, or bring somebody in via their, their beauty. And, and it's, really, it's really important, ladies, even in the church, just that we know how to not manipulate uh, um, with our bodies. In fact, Paul gives us a really good um, admonition in 1 Corinthians 7 when he talks about um, men's and women's bodies. And we'll do that in just a second. But there is a spirit that um, is prevalent in the world. There's a number of spirits. We'll talk about that when we talk about the kingdom. There's a, um, a spirit of Korah. There's a spirit of Absalom. There's a spirit of uh, Cain. And there's a spirit of Jezebel. 
And this spirit is not present in this church. It is a spirit that's pervasive in the earth. It talks about it in Revelations. I hope you read your Bible so that you can know that this is discussed, that she will be put on a bed of her own choosing, and she will have a lot of pain as a result. This spirit is something that you'll find in, in women where we become very manipulating, and you don't even know you're manipulating. And, and the idea is um, you can't use sex to get what you want or to leverage what you're not getting and, and, and bargain it. Um, it's, it's really detrimental to a marriage and it will cause incredible separation in the marriage. And so when we're doing these classes on marriage and learning um, how to relate to each other according to each other's um, uh, um, um, gender, male and female gender, a male's looking for one thing, a, a female's looking for another thing. And so when we start to understand that this is the one thing I get to say to the ladies, God, David will talk to you next week, you can't manipulate. And if, if everybody was honest about a story at one time or another, if they were mad at their husband or if they just felt like they were being slighted, there was a lot of turmoil. You can, this, is, this is what the scripture says. It says, let the husband render to his wife affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That means that if you're married and you're in covenant from stem to stern, David's mind, from hit the tip of his head to his toenails, that's my place of pleasure. That's where I go. That's my secret Eden. That's where we are one together and vice versa. When it says, do not, this is why he's telling you this, do not deprive one another except for a consent for time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that what? So that Satan doesn't tempt you. If in, this, in this manipulation or in this place where you get angry with each other, if you can't make peace, you're going to invite the enemy into the house, and that's where a house divider can't stand. That's, that's his admonition. He's saying this is an area that you have to come to terms with. You can't use it. When somebody's been, I, I, I've, I've had so many people I've had girls who have been molested as a kid, then they were promiscuous as, a, as an adolescent. Um, they let their bodies go as they got older to, to the point where they would grow their, it's called a skin flap, down over their genitalia because they were so disgusted. They won't have mirrors in their house. They, won't have, they hate sex. They hate relationship because they're so piled up. They've let their bodies go, and they're so stuffed with pain and anger that the only way they know how to feed that is to eat food, to stuff it down. They are slowly killing themselves and trying to take themselves off the market because they can't even comprehend somebody looking at them sexually because they've been so exploited. The pain is vast, and it's ubiquitous. That's my big ding, ding, ding word. That's a 20-pointer right there, <laughs> ubiquitous. Um, Anyway, I want you to listen to Tina's story. I want to end this on a positive note. I was telling David, I want to just spend weeks and weeks and weeks focusing on Jesus. In our church, for the longest time, we've used our platform here to train and to teach and to correct um, it, with the scripture. We're going to use Sunday school for training. We're going to use church for illuminating who Christ is in you and who you are in him. And that can be the focus now that we've separated and gotten into a, a category where we can put our, you know, not try to do so many things in one hour, but now we have people who need the training, we're going to give it to you. We're going to make this such a wonderful discipleship center on every level. And, and, and whosoever will come, I don't care who it is or where they're at, this is a place that we want to learn how to treat um, people right where they're at and, and lead them into the grace of God. And I, and I want to say something else. I, um, I, I actually am in a place where I need to have, I want to have conversations with people who are not in my hallelujah sphere. I, I need to know people who are homosexual. I need to know people who are promiscuous. I need to know people who are laden down. I need to bring the light into their life. But not only that, I, I want to know how to minister to them. I don't want to be so far away that we are just like, I don't get that. 
I don't, that's not what we're supposed to be. And so when we come in, schooling will be done, and then the focus on Jesus, which is our next series for many, many weeks, is on the kingdom of God. I want you to listen to Tina's story. It's a, it's a really beautiful redemptive story. If we'll roll that, that'd be great. Isn't that good? As a high school student, Dean Woo! Ogden was... Thank you. We'll do another one. Um, but but I, I just, for us in here today, what, what the take home is, is who, who are we? I mean, th these lies took this young girl, and I'm mean, like, we got young girls in our possession, in our stewardship, in our care right now. It's all we can do, every one of us in this room, to bestow them their beauty. There's, it's not incumbent on the passer, or it's, it's a community of people regarding and respecting and revering the sanctity and the gorgeousness of what God's given us in relationship. And we can't, we can't just turn away and, 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 and feel like, well, Everybody else is doing it, and, well, they're going to watch it anyway. No, we, we've got to let them know who they are. We've got to fight for them. We've got, to, we've got to make a stand so that we don't have to have these stories. I mean, from a Girl Scout to a prostitute, somebody wasn't an ambassador. Amen? Okay, so we're building ambassadors. And I want, I want to just make one more admonition, and this is something that I didn't talk about. Um, we haven't talked about at all with transsexuals. And there's an issue with transsexuals. The lie of Satan in their ear is so deep from their youth that they have heard that they're not good, that they are not, they're, they're not a boy, they're not a girl. They're, they, it gets so deep to the point where they'll cut their genitalia. Well, they'll take, in, they'll take, they'll take hormones to produce breasts. That's how deep the listen to me. It's not as if God is in heaven and so, oh my goodness, I made another mistake. You guys, angels, help me out here. There's another one I sat down with a mixed, it doesn't work that way. But what I want you to do is not judge them or make fun of them. I won't tolerate that for a second. I want you to get your, yourself into the place where you can have relationship enough. I don't want you to go out to the bars with them. I don't, I, I just, I want you to have relationship enough with them to be able to say, this, is, this has got to be a lie. You, you, you think God makes a mistake? It says in the scriptures, Psalms 131, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you in your mother's womb. And so these, I, I'm, I'm asking you to become relational. I'm asking you to become like Jesus. I'm asking you to not like, you know, have our, they're good, they're bad. We're the same, every one of us. We just got redeemed. And we want to help everybody else be redeemed. And I think it's so important that you, in the most loving, respectful way, say, it's a lie. Who told you that? Who told you that? Well, my father used to tell who told, I, I could tell you stories after stories. I think about Chastity Bono, Cher's daughter. I mean, she just so did want a woman. Was it because she had such an apex of a mother to look up to that she could never reach that status? And so she started to believe it was better to be a boy. I mean, you can go into any psychological direction you want, but you, the idea is, is that God didn't make a mistake. And so I just want to ask you this question, and, and we're going to wrap up here. I want you to, I know everybody, if you've been in church for a little while, you've heard this before. He says to Peter, or he says to the disciples, who do you say I am? Peter pipes up and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. But the more important question today is, who does he say you are? The most important thing about your relationship with God is what you think he thinks about you. If you think he's mad at you, if he thinks he's not, you're not pleasing to him, if you think for some reason he's up there waiting to see you make a mistake so he can thump you, you're wrong. Look at Hosea. Go get her. Go get her. Bring her back. Redeem her. I know you're humiliated. I know she's using you. I know she's giving her body away to other men. Go get her. Go get her. And it's the same thing I think about him just struggling with us time after time, pulling us in. And, and he is so redemptive and so restorative. And this is who he says you are. He says, you are my beloved. You're my beloved. I don't care what you've done. You're my beloved. He says that you are my bride. I gave my life to redeem you, and I'm coming back for you. I'm preparing a place for you now, and I will bring you to myself. Ten virgins. Five ready, five not. You're going to be ready. You're going to be ready. 
Hallelujah. He says, you are without spot or wrinkle. He says, I'm coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And we might want to reason in the church for the next 30 years that that's never going to happen. But I submit to you respectfully, it's already happened 2,000 years ago. You were made clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. No spot, no wrinkle. Start owning who you are. Philemon says that until you recognize what's in you, your faith can't even be effective. You're beautiful. You're gorgeous. You're redeemed. You're holy. You're sanctified. You're powerful. He says to us that you are my beloved. White as snow. Can you just feel it? Can you listen, listen, listen? He says, though your sins were so like scarlet, they were red as crimson. You are white as snow. Remember, Jesus comes in to the, the wedding supper, and there's somebody there without their wedding dress on, their wedding garb. But they were in the wedding. And then the Bible says that throw them out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you're going to assume that they're going straight to hell. That's what you're going to get. You don't have a relationship with God. You're going straight to hell. And listen, I submit to you again respectfully that weeping and gnashing of teeth is not the pit of fire. That's for the demons and, and a devil who is in great rebellion. That, ne- that gnashing of teeth and that weeping is, oh, I didn't know. I, it's, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. There's a great sorrow and separation, and I do believe that there is going to be a redemptive quality in that as well. Look at this. He says, I have given you authority over everything. Addiction, over, over, over shame. I've given you authority over your finances. I've given you authority over your healing. I've given you everything. Jesus says, I come and I give you my peace. My peace I give to you. Not as the world does. I give you peace. It's not going to come from a massage. It's not going to come from candles or aromatherapy or music. It comes from inside. You see your beauty and your value. I give you peace. You are powerful. Look at this picture. I loved this picture. <laughs> the sword, the word of God. This is how Jesus overcame. This is how you're going to overcome. But you will be distracted by the lies of Satan with your busyness. You won't be able to say, I don't have time to read the word. I don't have time to meditate. I don't. Listen, I understand seasons of life are busier than others. But you have to somehow have some, in, in, some feed that comes into your life so, so that when you, when you thirst, he, he fills. When, when you go to read, he quenches. How can you, I mean, even for my leaders, this is so important to me. I need to know that you're filling yourself because it's out of your overflow that you're going to lead others. If, you, do you understand how important this is? And look at that sword with the, with the menorah and the, and the beautiful star of David. And I'm, I just thought it was stunning. I was so happy when I found it. A woman of faith, he says that you are healed. Woman, your faith has healed you. Women, men. Your faith has healed you, knowing that 2,000 years ago this was finished. This was finished. So I know some of us are in various places of struggle, whether it be in our health, whether it be in our finances, whether it be in our marriage. I just am begging you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to, to, to talk, to confess, to get it out. What Lori did today was sensational. We need to get with each other. We, it's not just about testimonies and getting up here in air and dirt. It's really about, are you healed? Are you clean? Can God use you for his glory? Are you healed? Are you healed? Are you clean? You've got the wisdom of God. You've been redeemed. Every, your, all your bills are paid. you got debt right now. We need to talk. All your bills have been paid. What are you doing that's putting you in the hole? The Lord says that I will, I, will, I will prosper anything you put your hand to. Maybe we need to put our hand to something different. Just, just talk. We need to talk. That's what community does. That's how we get whole. This is a book that was so instrumental in my life as I was uh, abused as a child and also didn't know my way and stumbled away. I did everything that you could do wrong. I didn't know how to be a lover I know how to have sex, but I didn't know how to be a lover. I didn't know how to be loved. Gosh, what a criminal thing in life. What a criminal thing. But I can tell you now, at 51 years of age, I'm beautiful. I'm loved. It has nothing to do with what I look like. It's because I've received God's grace. I've received his mercies. This book is a very good book if you've had any damage in this area. And I want to invite you today. I want you to listen to this song in worship. I really, I think I want you to stand because I just think it would be good. Just let's stand. Let's listen to the heart of, of the Father here.
um, and just thank them. You know, we're here always to pray with you. We might not do it as liturgical as some churches are, but we are the body of Christ, and so we would love to pray with you. If you need prayer, we want to have a, a time uh, toward the end, but let's just thank God. The people I think sometimes that holds us captive in life are gone, way out of the picture. The only thing that holds us captive, Lori, is our head, is our thoughts. But by the way, you are that rose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember the video? Mm -hmm. You're that person. Each one of us is yes. that person. Amen. Um, it's the things that I have carried with me that trapped me for a long time. The other person had nothing to do with it anymore. I was trapped in a prison of my own mind. I drank poison and hoping it would kill the other person. And it, and it will never work that way. So I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next week, I want to talk to men. Women, you're off the hook now. Um, there's things I would like to say about the in, in the sermon, but I'm going to hold that off till next week. But men, you're going to be really on the spit next week. So prepare, bring an apple for your mouth, and we're going to put you <laughs> over the fire. Um, and I'm going to share stuff in my life that may help you as well. It's only the stuff that we've been healed from that we can talk about that's not secret anymore that um, helps other people. And that's what we're going to do. So go in the mercy and the grace of God. Be redeemers this week. Remember your ambassadors, and everywhere you walk, you bring the kingdom. Call heaven to earth in every situation. It's yours to take, whosoever will, as much as you need. We love you bunches, bunches, and bunches. If you want prayer, we're going to be up here. Uh, but for right now, we can stand up. We're dismissed. Amen. Let the party begin. Bless you. Mm -hmm.